Once again today we come to you in that name that's far above every name, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Good to see you here in the auditorium of the Northside Baptist Church today. We appreciate your presence. We welcome our visitors. And we appreciate you this listening out in the radio listening audience. And you out there in the listening audience, if you get on your phone and call a friend, especially a shut-in, and have them to tune in, get this hour coming up, we feel we can be an inspiration to them. You'll be doing them a favor, and us as well. I trust you do that. Now, this is Preacher Edward speaking. Now, the message, music, and singing will be on tape number 355. If you'd like to have this cassette tape, you just write in, close the gift for $3 or more. And say, Preacher Edward, send me the cassette tape number 355. Or I'm speaking on the subject, Why is the house of God forsaken? Why is the house of God forsaken? You can call for the tape by that title, or you can say, send me tape 355. My mailing address is Virgil Edwards, P.O. Box 501, Athens, Georgia. 30603 is the zip code number. You pray for me and write to me. We're working together in getting out the gospel. This is a home mission work to the glory of God. And if you pray for me and write to me next week, I appreciate it so very much. When you're writing, why don't you request a list of our cassette tape? We'll send you a list of about 340 or more. And if you'd like to have our brochure on our proposed holding in tour for next year, you might request that as well. Take your Bible today and turn to Nehemiah chapter 13. The book of Nehemiah in the Old Testament, chapter 13. And if you have a Schofield reference Bible, it'll be on page 555. 555 in the original Schofield reference Bible. Now I want you to turn there. I want you to follow me as I read the Word of God. And if you don't have the Schofield, original Schofield reference Bible, I don't know what page it'd be on, but you find the book of Nehemiah. I have a few original Schofield reference Bibles in my study. I try to accumulate a few during the year. Around Christmas time, people like to give gifts. They like to have this Schofield Bible. I can save you about $10 on each Bible. As I said, I'm not in the Bible selling business, just trying to accommodate people that like to have the original Schofield reference Bible. You turn there. I want you to follow me in the Scriptures. There's a minister one time trying out a, for the pastorate. He, that is, this church was looking for a pastor. They had him come to preach in the church, and it was a country church. All the members were country people. And at the close of service, they asked him a question. One man did, said, Sir, uh, since this is a country church, do you know anything about farming or do you know anything about country people? He said, no, sir, I'm sorry. said, I was reared up in the city. said, I know nothing about the farming. He said, my wife grew up on a dairy. And said, I never did see a cow until I met my wife. That'll sink in after a while. Just kind of think about it a few minutes. And uh, it'll sink in. All right. Nehemiah chapter 13. Beginning with verse 1. On that day they read in the book of Moses in the audience of the people. That it, therein was found written that the Ammonites and the Moabites could not come into the congregation of God forever. Because they met not the children of Israel with bread and with water. And hide Balaam against them. That he should curse them. Howbeit our God turned the curse into a blessing. Now it came to pass when they had heard the law that they separated from Israel all the mixed multitude. And before this, Elijah the priest, having the oversight of the chamber of the house of our God, was allied under Tobiah. And he had prepared for him a great chamber where aforetime they laid the meat offerings, the frankincense, and the vessels, and the tithes of the corn, and the new wine, and the oil, which was commanded to be given to the Levites, and the singers, and the porters, and the offerings of the priest. 
But all this time was not I at Jerusalem. And for in the two and thirtieth year of Artaxerxes, king of Babylon, came I unto the king. And after certain days obtained I leave of the king. And I came to Jerusalem and understood the evil that Elisha him did for the, uh, Tobiah and prepared him a chamber in the courts of the house of God. And it grieved me sore, therefore, and I cast forth all the household stuff of Tobiah out of the chamber. Then I commanded, and they cleansed the chambers, and thither brought I again the vessels of the house of God with meat offerings and frankincense. And I perceived that the portion of the Levites had not been given them, for the Levites and the singers that did the work were, very, were fled every one to his field. Then I contended, I was with the rulers, and said, Why is the house of God forsaken? And I gathered them together and set them in their place. Then brought all Judea the tithes of the corn and, and the new wine and the oil under the treasuries. And I made treasures over the treasures. Shilamiah the priest and Zadok the scribe and of the Levites, Bediah, and next to them was Hanan, the son of Zechur, the son of Matthiah, for they were counted faithful, and their office was to distribute unto their brethren. Remember me, O my God, concerning this, and warp not out my good deeds that I have done for the house of my God and for the office thereof. Now take a look at verse 11, and look at the middle of that verse. Why is the house of God forsaken? Now I want you to read that with me. Come on so I can hear you. Why is the house of God forsaken? I didn't hear you too good. Come on. Why is the house of God forsaken? One more time. Come on, say it with me. Why is the house of God forsaken? All right. Now look at verse 14. Remember me, O oh my God, concerning this, and wipe not out my good deeds that I have done for the house of my God and for the office thereof. Now come on, read that verse with me. Remember me, O oh my God, concerning this, and wipe not out my good deeds that I have done for the house of my God and for the office thereof. Now Nehemiah was a great prophet of God, a man that had gone back to Jerusalem, after being carried away into Babylon into captivity, he went back there to build the walls of, around the city of Jerusalem. He was a broken-hearted man because the temple had been destroyed and the walls had been torn down. And he was concerned about why the house of God had been forsaken. Now every true born-again believer ought to be concerned about the house of God. The Bible has much to say about it. And Jesus said much about it. And Jesus attended the synagogue in his day. And Paul always found himself in the house of God. Or the synagogue. Or wherever he preached. Now there's several reasons that gives us the answer. Why is the house of God forsaken? I want you to get this message today. If you ever got a message from this preacher. I want you to get this message today from the Word of God. Why is the house of God forsaken? Number one, it is forsaken because of the spiritual condition of its unsaved membership. You'd be surprised, you'd be shocked, and we all would to know how many people you have in your congregation that have their name on the church roll that are not saved. Now the very lives, the very deeds, the very acts prove that they're not saved. And there's a lot of church members that are members of churches that are not saved. Now in a fundamental, Bible-believing church where the Word of God has been preached, explained to people, then of course you have fewer people that's not saved in that audience. But in the average church today, I venture to say you have less than half the people that know anything about being saved. They go to church for respectability. 
They have been trained and taught to go. And they go maybe on Sunday morning. That's about it. But they know nothing about the salvation of God. Know nothing about being saved. That's one reason the house of God is forsaken. You have a bunch of unsaved church members with the names on the church roll. And you can't find them half the time whenever they ought to be in God's house for service. They're unsaved. If they ever get saved, there'll be no problem. They're spiritually dead. In Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 1, you had the quicken who were dead in trespassing sins. They're spiritually blind. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 3 and 4, the Bible said the gospel hid from them. They're spiritually blind. And they are spiritually enslaved. And you need to realize that uh, maybe in other means in the true spirit of God. Now they're unsaved. That's one reason the house of God is forsaken. In many of our churches today, we're pumping and pulling and dragging and pleading and begging people to come to church when they don't know anything about God. And they could care less about the church. They could pass up the church like a freight train passing up a tramp, think nothing about it, because they're unsaved. Now, if they were truly saved, it'd be a different story. Now, we need to realize that the Bible says in Romans chapter 3 and verse 11, there's none that understandeth, there's none that seeketh after God, talking about the unsaved people. And there'll be millions and millions of church members in hell they had their name on the church roll, even been baptized as sprinkled, but knew nothing about God. And that's sad. And many of our large churches today, where they put a lot of stress on numbers, you'd be surprised at the people that are pulled in there for numbers' sake that know nothing about God. They hang around for a while and then they're gone. And many of those large churches today, and I'm sorry to say it's among the fundamental ranks, they are going down every Sunday from maybe a thousand to five hundred to two hundred because through high pressure and other methods and gimmicks they pulled into the house of God and baptized people, put names on the church road and nothing about God. And they remain just for a short while and then they faded away. They're out. You can't get them to God's house. They don't know where they are. Reason number two. God's house is forsaken because of lack of a vision and concern. There's never been a day and a time when there's so much unconcernness and lack of vision among God's people as you'll find in the house of God today. Members no longer invite sinners to come to the church. There used to be a day in the early years of my ministry when church members worked uh, feverishly to get sinners to God's house. And they got many of them there, and many of them got saved. But how many church members today really try to get sinners to God's house? Now you just ask yourself, you're a church member, how many sinners last week did you try to get to come to church today? Now unless you bring them in, they're not coming. God never told them to go to God's house, but God's people have to go after them or bring them in or get them right with God. Because they're not coming to God's house. They have no reason to do so. But there was a day whenever saints of God, Christian people, come in with a half a dozen sinners that they invited to church. They'd preach and get up and preach and they'd get saved, many of them. How many sinners have we invited this past week to the house of God? You ask yourself that question. That's one reason the house of God is forsaken. And Luke chapter 14, verse 21, Go out quick in the streets and lanes of the city and bring in the the poor and the main, the halt and the blind. Jesus said, Go bring them in here that my house may be filled. Now we're just not doing that. We are not trying to get sinners anymore to come to the house of God. We've quit. We've stopped doing that. We're too concerned about other things. We have other things we want to be engaged in and we're not concerned about it anymore. No longer kin for souls. There used to be a time when church members were concerned about lost souls. They'd pray about their lost brothers and sisters and friends and loved ones. Cry to God to save them, but that's not happening much anymore. In Psalms 142 and verse 4, He said, I looked on my right hand and beheld, There was no man that would know me, refuge fail me, and no man cared for my soul. How many sinners out there today can say nobody cares for my soul. I've never been in, invited to church. I've never been asked if I'm a lost sinner, if I'm going to hell. 
Nobody cares for my soul. Now, if God's people don't care for the sinner, who will? God expects us to care for them, be concerned about them. And yet the church member today is self-satisfied. He's unconcerned about that sinner. He says, well, that sinner knows the church house in the community. Let him come if he wants to. That's the wrong attitude. We should let him know that he should get right with God and should come to the house of God. Number three, God's house is forsaken because its members do not commend the church and its ministry to others. Let me ask you a question. I wouldn't dare to ask you to raise your hand, but how many of you this past week, you commended your church to others? You told people that didn't have a church. You told others about Northside. And you told people that's looking for a church home about Northside. How many of you have done that this past week? If I should ask you to raise your hand, we'd all be embarrassed. So few, so very few, if any, invited sinners this past week or anybody, people looking for a church home, you recommended your church. You said you ought to be in Northside. You ought to come to Northside. If you don't have a good fundamental Bible-believing church home, you ought to come to Northside. How many has done that? You ought to do that every day of your life. You run into people every day that you can invite to Northside on your job, in your community, that come to your house for various reasons. You ought to do that. Our Christian people used to do that. But I'm afraid very few don't do it anymore. The devil can use the members to criticize the church. It's not hard for church members to criticize the church and criticize the pastor and criticize others in the church. That's easy. You can do that. They sometimes fight one another instead of the devil. God didn't intend for his people to fight each other, but to fight the devil. A lot of people quit fighting the devil and start fighting each other. And they have to have a little sugar tit to keep them in good humor. If not, they get mad and pout about something. You shouldn't have to give a church member that's saved a sugar tit every time he turns around to keep him in good human, keep him in church. You shouldn't have to do that. But I'm sorry to say today because you have so many that's never grown in the Lord and still babies, they got to have that bottle. they got to have that little sugar tit. You know what a sugar tit is, don't you? You've seen mothers years ago, whatever, they all want to give the little baby something and put some sugar in a little piece of cloth and... Maybe put something else in there that tasted pretty good. I don't know, wouldn't know what to say. And then they would stick that in that baby's mouth. And man, did he like that. That's what you call a sugar tit. And you have to give a lot of church members sugar tit about every Sunday. They'll get mad and won't be back uh, the next Sunday. That's a shame. That's a reflection on the people that have to have the sugar tits. And you shouldn't have to do that. There's other things more important than passing out bottles and passing out sugar tits and milk bottles to babies that's been saved 40 years. I don't mind giving a little small baby a bottle, but when I have to part the whiskers and some of them gray and cram a bottle into that baby's mouth, I don't like that. Uh, them whiskers bother me. Uh, I tell you, you shouldn't have to do that. That's wrong. That's a reflection on... The people that are saved to require a bottle or sugar tit every time you turn around. But that happens. And then not only that, number, number five, it is forsaken because of sinful like and concern. A sinful like of concern. Sometimes you unfriended the visitors. I hope that's not true at Northside. Uh, sometimes they do not care if the church door is closed or if it's open on Sunday. They do not support the work with their tithes and offers. They don't care. As far as they're concerned, you can shut her up. Nail up the windows. I don't give a rip. Let sinners go to hell. Let say people backslide. Let the chastening rod of God come. Let hell break loose. I don't care. That's the attitude of many church members. And they prove that by their concernness about how they are friendly toward visitors, about how they want to be sure that the church door is kept open, and that the financial phase of the church is kept up, that you meet your obligations week after week. Now, born again, believes in love, God are concerned about those things, but you have many church members not. 
You have some church members, if you had to depend upon what they give financially, where could God just nail the doors up today and never open them again? They, they don't care. Let sinners go to hell, shut the doors. If they died, they'd like to have a funeral in the church, a wedding, they'd like to have that there maybe, or uh, something, but otherwise, just nail her up, let her go. Starve the preacher to death, let him have to leave and go somewhere else. That's their attitude. And so every time that a saved person refuses to put his work finest, he's voting to shut the door, and he's voting to get rid of his pastor. Oh, you say, Preach Edwards, I like you pretty good. I'd hate for you to leave, and I want to see them doors swinging open every Sunday. What do you put in the collection plate? Oh, you say, Preach, I, I don't put nothing in the collection plate. Well, you're voting to shut the doors. You're voting to get rid of your preacher. That's exactly what you're doing. Whether you realize it or not, you're doing that. And you may be doing it, you may not realize you're doing it, but that's exactly what you're doing. You said, let's close her up. Let's get rid of our preacher. Don't have anything to, but to preach to the lumber yard. Let's, let's let him go. That's exactly your attitude by your actions. And your action speaks louder than words. People's actions speaks louder than words. Now you must remember that. Reason number six, it is forsaken because we're living in the last days. Now you listen to me. If we are living in the last days, that should tell us something. If that be true, and we know that is true, then if there's ever a time we ought to be faithful, and every time we ought to serve God and work for God and support the work of God, it ought to be right now. Right now. Yesterday afternoon, we heard a terrible blast. And we heard for miles and miles and miles, and we thought something had blown up right now. I thought this dynamite not here on the slot, this clean off. My wife and I came out of the house, and we wondered what in the world, I, uh, toward the church first, see if anything had blown up up here. Come to find out people for miles and miles around heard that terrible blast. Didn't sound exactly like thunder. It sounded different from thunder. And I got to thinking, what if that had been the wrath of God? Or what if that had been a, a Russian uh, missile? Or something like that. What if that had been that? Now, where would we be? What would, what would uh, the story be today? I don't know what it was. I, I just surmised it was some kind of thunder. Uh, electrical reasons causing that. I don't, I don't know, but it, it started thundering after that. But I'd never heard a blast like that before, never in my life. And other people have heard, never heard one just like that. Something different. You know what may happen? I'll tell you anything can happen now. And you better get kind of tuned up and, and zeroed in because anything can happen now. Now, I'm not trying to intimidate you, but I'm giving you the cold facts. We're living in the last days. Second Timothy chapter 3, verse 1 and 2. This also in the last days, perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves. Let that sink in for a moment. Men love their own self. They're more concerned about themselves, their ease, or what to have, what to do, than they are about the things of God. Loves their own selves. And 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 3, Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first. Now God said there's coming a falling away, and we are in it right now. We're in that falling away. I've seen a time whenever every seat in this church is taken. I'm preaching the same gospel today and deeper in the Bible because I put more hours in study and preparation. I was back in those days 30 years ago whenever every seat was taken in this church. I've seen a time we put folding chairs out here to help accommodate the people. I'm still preaching the gospel uh, deeper in the book. I'm not braggadocious about it. It's a known fact. Uh, you know that yourself. I spent all these years in Bible study preparation that might feed you and give you what God said, but the church is not full today. Wow, what's happened? We're living in the days of the falling away. And that crowd sitting out there that ought to be in God's house this morning, they are caught in the falling away. They're falling away from the service for God. It's shame. It's a pity and they're growing older every day. And the coming of Jesus draweth nigh every day. We need to realize that living in the days of falling away. 
Number seven, it is forsaken because the Holy Spirit is hindered from doing His work. Now, there used to be a time when the average church depended largely upon the operation of the Holy Spirit. But today, in many of our churches, they have their cut and dried programs, their little shindigs, get, get orders down from headquarters, denominational headquarters, and have their cut and dried sermons. They're a highly educated ministry. They are uh, robe choirs. They are highly trained musicians. And all set up. They're beautiful furniture, beautiful buildings. And Jesus said in the book of Revelation, said, You say I'm rich, have need of nothing. He said, You don't realize you're poor, you're blind, and you're naked. God help us to realize it's the Holy Spirit that's going to do the job anytime we let material things the beauty of the building, um, the ease of being in the building and all those things stand between us and the work of the Holy Spirit of God. We are missing it. I'd rather preach under an old tabernacle building and the shavings on the ground and wooden benches and have the power of God on my preaching and souls being saved and the moving of the Spirit of God than to be in the most beautiful church in Athens, Georgia, preaching from the pulpit. I mean that. I'm not concerned about beautifying i like god's work to be nice and and we have a nice church here nice as anybody needs but i'm not uh, concerned about uh, such decoration and pushing the spirit of god out and programming god out of the church i'm not concerned about that i'm concerned about people coming in and getting the gospel depending on the spirit of god that's not happening many, much in these days we feel we can get along without god we feel we can get along without the Holy Spirit. We're well trained, and our, our pastor, uh, he's been, you know, the seminary, and he knows all the answers, and, and he's been, uh, had his sermons given to him and handed down. Uh, and, uh, so we just well fixed. That's the attitude of the average church member today. Not going to have the Holy Ghost. Not going to have the power of God. Not going to have men that preach the book anymore. They want a little sermonette, a little preacher read, and, then they go down in the basement, then they all add and act like a bunch of babies in a bassinet. That's the way it's happening today. God help us to realize that. And then number eight, what did God say for us to do about a situation like this? God doesn't leave us in the dark. He tells us what to do. Remember my text, why is the house of God forsaken? God's house should not be taken lightly. It's an important place. It's where God meets with His people. Why should it be forsaken? Jesus said, My house, my Father's house, be made a house of prayer. Why is forsaken? What should we do about it? Let me give you a verse of Scripture, and I want you to listen to this verse of Scripture. In Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 25, He said, Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. Now that's what we've done here this morning. We're assembled together. That's what he's talking about. Don't be careless about going to church is what he's saying. Don't be careless about forsaking our assembly ourselves together, uh, together as the manner of some is. That crowd sitting out there and some of them listening to me right now know they ought to be in God's house. As the manner of some is. That's that crowd. They're not in God's house. As the manner of some is but exhorting one another. That is encourage each other. Exhort one another. And so much the more as you see that day approaching. Now, what is he saying? Don't misunderstand me. There's elderly people, there's sick people, there's handicapped people that just love to be in church. My dear old daddy on his deathbed said, Son, when I could have been in God's house helping you, I, I wasn't at times. And I'm sorry about it. He, he grieved his heart that he didn't help me more in the ministry by being present. By supporting God's work in his dying hour, he knew that. And he repented about it. He, he told me he was sorry about it. The Bible said, as the man of some is exhorting one another, and so much the more, so much the more as you see that day approaching. Now you can see the day of the coming of the Lord approaching. All the signs that you see today that God mentions in the Bible. Uh, the Jews going back to the Holy Land. Many I can mention. Let us know without a shadow of a doubt. The Lord is soon coming back. 
And it won't be long. This world can't stand much longer. Over in France, they've invented a pill over there where mothers can kill their babies in a little easier way than having to go to the hospital and have the doctor kill them. And uh, been uh, almost, uh, well, there's a million and a half of them killed every day in America, slaughtered, put to death by those doctors and other people that's doing the job. And they've invented this pill now that you can, the women can take it and about three times and kill their unborn baby. And uh, that's going to mean more and more that's going to happen. Do you think God Almighty is going to put up with that forever? There's more people, there's more young babies destroyed in New York City in just a matter of a few months than was killed in Vietnam during the entire war. You think God's going to always put up with that? Where's the most dangerous place for an infant today? In an automobile? In a baby carriage? In a baby bed? Where's the most dangerous place for an infant today? You want me to tell you? In his mother's womb. Allowed to be killed just any time. Now you need, these things are serious and God's not going to always put up with it. And he said, now not forsaken the assembly ourselves together as some is, as you see that time approaching. Now let me give you an illustration. He said, go to church. That's what he's talking about. Get together. Be faithful in attending your church service. Be faithful. Be there. That's what he said. Because the coming of the Lord draw nigh. There's never been a time in the history of the world as we have known it, uh, that we need to be faithful in serving God as in this hour because we're closer right now to the coming of Jesus when you've ever been. And you're closer to the graveyard than you've ever been. And so am I. Those two reasons ought to in encourage us to be faithful in serving God. Now, when I was a little boy, born out on a farm, we used an open fireplace. And there, that oak wood would produce uh, fire coals. They would be red. And we'd sit there before the fire, and as a little boy, I noticed occasionally one of those little fire coals would roll off from the others and roll about a foot, or uh, maybe 18 inches out away from the other fire coals. And, and I watched that fire coal. It was red, but in a matter of seconds, it began to turn gray and black, and finally, it was beginning to be cold. There's no fire there anymore. Now, why was there no fire anymore in that fire coal? It had gotten away from the other coals, out to itself, isolated, and it died out. And that's exactly what's happened to a lot of church members. You need to come to God's house, assemble yourselves, be with God's people, or you're going to be like that coal of fire that falls by the wayside and dies out. The other coals will be burning, but you're going to die out. That coal of fire cease to be red, cease to be hot, cease to be warm, turn gray, turn black, it's gone. And that's what's happened to a lot of church members, all because they fail the house of God. Why is the house of God forsaken? They have failed the house of God. They have failed to be there, and that's exactly why. Beloved, they just backslid. God had to move them off the scene. Any of them in, uh, out there being chastened by God, backslid on God, their loved ones going to hell and they think nothing about it. Now, if there's a great danger of you losing what you've done in the house of God. In Nehemiah chapter four, verse 14, we read it. Remember, O my God, concerning this, warp not out my good deeds that I have done for the house of my God and the office thereof. Nehemiah said, don't, don't warp out my deeds. God, I've done for the house of God. A lot of church members have been faithful in days gone by in God's house. They built themselves up reward in heaven. And then they fool around like that coal of fire, backslid on God. And everything they've done for God is going to be wiped out. Amen. Nehemiah said, don't warp out what I've done for the house of God. Second John chapter eight, uh, chapter, second John verse eight, look to yourselves that will lose not those things which you have wrought, but that you receive a full reward. It breaks my heart to see church members one time faithful to God, one time faithful in God's house, and now they're not. They're going to lose everything that they ever accomplished for God and how ashamed they're going to be when they come to the judgment seat of Christ. Why is the house of God forsaken? I have told you why. And that's it. 
Now, whether you want to accept it, that's between you and God. Let's stand to our feet. Father in heaven, I pray in Jesus' name that you speak to our hearts today. God, I've tried to show the people here and the people out in the radio listening audience why the house of God is forsaken. I pray you'll help us, dear Lord. Help us to realize, God, that we shouldn't allow the house of God to be forsaken. It's a very important place. You put your name there. You meet here with your people and other Bible-believing churches. God help us. And have your way, our Father, in our hearts. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Debbie, you play a stanza so, and there's somebody here today that God has spoken to you, and you feel like you ought to come forward. Come down here and let us help you. Go ahead and play us a stanza, Debbie. Amen.